Now we'll take a few moments for our meditation. I'm going to lead you through a meditation. You're invited to lower your gaze or perhaps close your eyes as you feel comfortable. And let's take a few deep breaths together, relaxing with each breath. Breathing in through your nose, in self, breathing out kindness. Breathing in self, exhaling kindness. Breathing in self. Exhaling kindness. Relaxing, continue to notice your breathing and shift your focus upon your heart. You may wish to place your hand over your heart or place a finger on your wrist to sense your pulse. Rediscover the rhythm of your beautiful heart. From the early moments of your body's beginning, this heart was yours, beating, 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 bringing you to and through every experience of your life. This heart, yours, this heartbeat in perpetua, perpetuating your life, allowing you to feel love, express kindness, and to feel heartache, and at times, heartbreak. This heart, give gratitude to your heart. You were born to experience joy in this world, to play through movement, to dance, to create, to give and receive love. During the next moments of silence, give thanks and send love to your precious heart. Good morning, everyone. I'm Reverend Becky. I'm an interfaith minister, and I am deeply grateful to be joining you all today on World Kindness Day. And I'm going to start with a quote from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. My religion is very simple. My religion is kindness. This is my simple religion. There is no need for temples, no need for complicated philosophy. Our own brain, our own heart is our temple. The philosophy is kindness. Today's service honors World Kindness Day. And World Kindness Day was first introduced as a day of observation by the World Kindness Movement. The history of the group stretches back to a Tokyo-based convention in 1997. An array of institutions and associations based in countries including Australia, Thailand, the United States, and the United Kingdom have assembled over the years through conferences dedicated to championing kindness in society. In 2019, the organization was registered as an official NGO under Swiss law. And now the World Kindness Movement has created a written declaration of their inception, stating their pledge to join together to build a kinder and more compassionate world. It is my hope that today's service inspires each of us not only to embrace new opportunities for kindness, but for each of us to expand our personal understanding and contemplation of the role kindness plays and boomerangs in each of our lives. Kindness we extend to ourselves, kindness we extend to others, and perhaps the most important of all for the movement of kindness 
our ability to accept kindness from others. In the opening prelude video that we had this morning, The Kindness Boomerang, we witnessed a series of kind acts triggered by the previous kindness that ultimately led to the very first initiator of kindness in the sequence being blessed by an act of kindness himself. Kindness boomerangs come back to us for two primary reasons. First is our ability to extend ourselves in kindness, often while overriding internal narratives, objections, and judgments. And second, kindness boomerangs because of our ability to open and receive an act of kindness. If either of these is blocked or restricted, kindness won't be let out. The topic of kindness fascinates me for so many reasons, and especially because kindness literally saved my life. I'm in my early 50s now, but in my mid-50s, an illness ripped in my 30s, in my mid-30s, yeah, I'm like fast forward into the future. In my mid-30s, I'm not gonna, I'm not projecting here. An illness in my mid-30s flipped through my life, leaving, um, ripping me from my career, leveling me in pain and in bed. That was until I started living with dedication and devotion to practicing acts of kindness to myself, to others, and to open to receive the very kindness I aspired to give to others. I didn't know it until years later, but literally kindness had become the very medicine that healed me. With the election this week, I found myself contemplating the role kindness plays in politics. You're supposed to laugh there. <laughs> I wondered this week, is it possible for democracy and kindness to coexist? Think about that. And if it does, if it can, how might kindness help us see and honor each other's humanity, our needs for love, validity, and being seen? Kindness as the great an unifying force honoring the breadth of our diversities. How can we live in, in a democracy that values, dare I say, prioritizes kindness? Perhaps it's in the audacity with which we choose to live our lives in kindness, in the quiet roar, the positive, powerful ripples and boomerangs of acts of kindness that do indeed change the entire world every second she turns. Having studied some of the world's religions in seminary the last couple of years, I discovered many commonalities. I sought ways religions evoked kindness as a moral compass, and I found it in Christianity, Paganism, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Native American and indigenous spirituality. Across each of these, remarkably, there are sacred texts and teachings offering some form of the golden rule, which is do unto others as you would have done unto you. Each of these religion, religions perpetuate the value of kindness as a means to connect us in human mutuality. And yet religion, like politics, is often leveraged as a way to categorize and divide us from each other and renounce our humanity. Today, I'm going to present this sermon in three parts, aspiring to take us into a currency most each and every one of us are afforded every day, and that is the currency of human kindness. For each part, I'll posit one question, intending to expand your personal awareness of different aspects of kindness in your daily life. Ultimately, I hope your contemplation will contribute to the kindness boomerang effect. Part one, otherly kindness. How do I act, how do I enact kindness in others? Hang on. We keep, oh, you be my Vanna, will you be my Vanna way? <laughs> Thank you, you can sit back down at every time. I'll tell you when I say part two. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Vanna, Vanna Valerie. 
So um, our first question, how do I enact kindness to others despite internal narratives, objectives, and judgments? Now this first story is not a feel-good story about choosing to do something kind for someone, but I'm going to tell you anyway, in honor of the fact that sometimes it hurts deeply to open our hearts and extend kindness with the intention of alleviating another person's suffering. A while ago, I was in a grocery store when a woman asked me for 50 cents towards buying some chicken. She said she was hungry. I didn't have any cash, but I offered to buy her chicken if she didn't mind sticking around with me while I finished my shopping. She didn't say anything, but started walking beside me in the grocery store. She had a very sad demeanor, and I noticed she had a black eye. She shuffled her feet as she walked. She slurred her speech. I noticed many judgments rise in me. I kept shopping, and I began talking to her, asking her if she was okay as I had noticed her black eye. She said she had a seizure and hit her head, but that her temporary roommate didn't call 911 because she woke up. She didn't know what caused the seizure. I noticed my internal reasoning and retelling of her story as if she was lying to me. She watched me place more items in my shopping cart. I became aware of where my purse was. I asked her if she'd like to get more groceries to go with her chicken. I said I'd buy up to $10 of groceries for her. She just stared vacantly, walked off, coming back with an armful now of raw chicken. She stood there holding the chicken, looking at me. I told her I was happy to help her and please put the chicken in the basket. I picked up some yogurt drinks for my three children. I felt aware and almost uneasy about being able to buy the groceries I needed for my own family. I noticed my internal story. I asked her if she had children. Three girls, she said, children that had been taken from her because her mother called Child Protective Services. I started to notice other shoppers around us giving her edgy, distrusting looks. She asked me if I could imagine my own mother having my children taken away from me, and then asked me, why would her mother have done that? I told her I couldn't imagine that. I told her that perhaps her mother was worried about her kids' safety. I asked her if her children were safe with her. She shrugged and shifted her eyes down. Again, inside my head, I heard my own different version of her story. Her speech slurred. She seemed in a slow motion haze. We finally got to the checkout. I asked her what needed to change for her situation to improve. She said getting her own place would be good. I told her that I really hoped it would work out for her. I paid for her chicken and all of my other groceries. She didn't say anything as I handed it to her. I found myself waiting for her to thank me. But then I redirected my thoughts to the reason I was doing this in the first place. It certainly was not to be thanked, but to show compassion and to do what I could in this moment to help her. I wished her well and left the shop with my grocery cart full as she used her cell phone to call a friend, perhaps to get a ride. I got into my car and I felt terribly uneasy, dreadful about the whole experience. Deep down, I knew the best and perhaps the only thing I could have done in that moment was to buy her the food she had asked for, even though I had no idea how she was gonna cook the raw chicken. I said a prayer for her and her daughters. I cried. It didn't feel good to do this for her, but it truly felt like the only thing I could have done. Now, it's interesting to consider my inner dialogue and judgments and my hesitancy even to share the story because it's not this, you know, happy, joy, kindness story. I didn't let my negative, judgmental inner thoughts change anything of my actions except 
to find a way to more deeply open to her, to be a witness to her, to hear her, to be beside her when so many others in the store seemed to run away from her, to attempt to give her what she said she needed in the moment. What more could I have done? What could I have done differently, I wonder? I wish I could have done more. I wish, I wish. I wish that I'd had the presence of mind to ask her for her name. Part two. Self-kindness. How am I kind to myself? My son and I were grocery shopping. This always happens at the grocery store. It's like the best place for, for possible kindness. At the checkout, a mother was trying to understand the reason that her bill was higher than she'd expected. She didn't have enough money for all of her groceries. And the grocery store manager removed the items from her card and carried them back to the refrigerator section. My son and I watched, trying not to appear nosy or to intrude. We smiled at her little boy, who was perhaps two years old. His beautiful brown eyes and bright smile, his deepening gaze filled my heart while it simultaneously broke my heart at the situation unfolding. I whispered to my son and I told him to run and get the manager back with the items. My son was confused, he didn't understand me. I was attempting to do an act of kindness, but it was going wrong. The lady left the store with her son and with fewer groceries than she had anticipated. I told the checkout guy, charge me for her groceries, and then we'd run out to the parking lot and catch her. He said, you'd do that? And I said, yes, I want to make sure they have what they need. He quickly called the manager back over the loudspeaker, ran up my items and, and hers, and my son and I ran out into the parking lot where we thought we would find her buckling her son into the car. That was the plan. But the mom and the son were gone. I have no idea where they went. They were gone literally in like 60 seconds. And with them went my opportunity to gift these measly but necessary items. My son and I walked around the parking lot, dazed, perplexed, sad, asking other shoppers if they'd seen them. No one had. We were too late. We had a lovely conversation with another mother in the parking lot about our almost act of kindness. She said that it's people like us that give her hope, but it didn't feel like hope at all to me. I felt ashamed and terrible for not speaking up immediately and telling her immediately that I wanted to do that for her so that I wouldn't miss the chance for kindness. I kept thinking about my reasons for my hesitation because I didn't want to embarrass her. I didn't want to cause a fuss because I was worried about 10 days time and my future grocery trip and my own monetary situation. All mind made reasons working to convince me of holding back a necessary kindness. Even though I didn't believe any of those thoughts, the act of processing them slowed me down. My son and I got into the car with our groceries and hers. We felt awful. My son said it was his fault for not running and getting the manager back quickly enough. Another mind made untruth. So there we were a few days later at home, drinking milk that should have been filling that little boy's tummy, staring at undelivered, unkinded cheese in my fridge that we end up, end up eating because it was there. And so, I ask myself and you, dear friends, if we choose not to act towards kindness because we have allowed our minds to slow our actions towards acting for love and kindness, is it still an act of kindness? I think perhaps our best attempt at generating kindness from this story comes from the possibility of self-kindness for my son and I to forgive ourselves the delay, forgive ourselves for holding back what our hearts and hands intuitively knew to do, but was denied due to our own hesitancy. Because of this situation, our future acts have been delivered with greater haste as intended and necessary for love and kindness. 
And for this, I am deeply grateful that this undelivered kindness taught me that self-kindness is an act of kindness. And now part three, receiving kindness. How do I receive kindness from others? A quote from Princess Diana, carry out a random act of kindness with no expectation of reward, safe in the knowledge that one day someone might do the same for you. Perhaps the most significant stage in the kindness boomerang comes from our ability to accept the very kindness we enjoy giving to others. There are many reasons we try to block people's kindness. Pride, feelings of inadequacy, like I should be able to take care of this and handle this myself. I don't want to be a burden on anyone. But the greater truth is we belong to each other. If we are willing to commit acts of kindness, we must open to be blessed by the kindness of others. We know how wonderful it feels to commit an act of kindness for someone. And others deserve to feel this sense of connectedness and significance too. Years ago, when my children were small, I'm at the grocery store again. <laughs> I was doing the week's shopping and the bill came to $113. I tried my ATM card, but drew a mental blank on the pin. And I tried two different numbers and then my card was blocked from a third attempt. I asked the checkout person to hold my order and my children and I left and drove across the street to my bank to try to take money out from a different account to no avail. I came back to the grocery store parking lot and dug around the car on the floor. Have you done that? <laughs> Digging around, trying to find money on the floor, down the seats. And we managed to come up with $8 and we went back into the store. I decided we were gonna get bread, milk and bananas because that would see us through the next morning. We walked up to the checkout person again who was ringing up a new customer's order as my cart sat there, ice cream melting. I explained that I'd just take a few of the things and with tears, I apologized as I realized they were now gonna to have to put all of my unbought groceries away. The man who was ringing up, was being rung up, asked the checkout person what was going on. And she explained that I didn't have enough money for my groceries, <laughs> to which I said, no, no, to which he said, no, no, not on my watch. This is not going to happen. How much do you need, he turned to me. I said, no, 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 you can't do that. It's over $100. I couldn't possibly accept. And he said, no, no, please, I want to do this for you. I know what it's like. I have children of my own. Please let me do this for you. I was stunned. I looked at the sincerity, the kindness in his eyes, the kindness coming from his heart to his hands. And I realized I needed to accept his kindness. But, you know, like give myself a break. Humbled, I thanked him profusely. I asked him for his address so I could mail him a check when I got home, which I did do. My children and I walked out to the car. I was sobbing for so many reasons. For relief that I didn't have to <laughs> figure out to the next day going shopping for the, the relief of the whole situation of not having enough and him helping. Sobbing for the joy, sobbing for the connection with a stranger sobbing for this kindness and for so many other kindnesses that I had been part of. My daughters helped load the groceries in the car. My eldest daughter said to me, I'm glad that happened to you and not to me because I don't think I'd know what to have done. I responded to her, my sobbing continued, when you're in need, we should always accept kindness. If we're gonna live a life where we aspire to give kindness, we must step into the flow of kindness and open to receive it when we need it. We can't only be the givers of kindness, otherwise it won't work. And then I suddenly realized the kindness that I'd been giving and living previously for years was disingenuous. It wasn't until this happened that I acknowledged that I too deserve depend and need kindness. That the act of me giving kindness wasn't the only way I could contribute to kindness. 
that I needed to open to receive it too. So as we reflect on these three questions, and as we contemplate our relationship, our commitment to giving and receiving kindness upon this World Kindness Day, I trust that each of you are going to extend kindness to other people. I'm not worried about that. I know many of you here, very kind people. So I'm going to invite you instead of on World Kindness Day, which is probably what's happening where everyone else is talking about World Kindness Day, go out and do kind things to other people. I'm going to invite you to go forth in kindness to yourself. Sacred kindness. I believe sacred kindness is when we take care of ourselves, that we have enough that flows out that might bless others. Perhaps today is a kindness day for yourself. Fill up your own cup filled with sacred kindness. And perhaps open to receive the very kindness you wish to give others. The theme for this year's World Kindness Day is a quote from the Dalai Lama. Be kind whenever possible. The full quote is, be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. So go, go forth in love, go forth in kindness, go forth in sacred self-kindness. I am you, we are. I am you, we are. I am you, we are. Blessed be. Amen. Aho. Anushik. <laughs>